Welcome to South South News. I'm Bill Miller. On January 12, 2010, a horrific earthquake struck Port-au-Prince, Haiti. It's been estimated that over 250,000 people lost their lives and 1.3 million were dispossessed. Let's flash back to that time, but also let's look in the present and see what's happening in Haiti to rebuild the country and to help the people get their lives back together. My guest today is someone who's very knowledgeable about what's going on in Haiti. Gary Pierre Pierre is the founder of the Haitian Times. He founded it in 1999. He's written numerous articles on Haiti. In fact, he used to work for the New York Times. He's an award-winning Pulitzer Prize winner that he shared for covering the World Trade Center disaster. And he is currently the president of the New York Press Association. Gary Pierre Pierre, welcome to South South News. Thank you. I, appreci I appreciate you being with me. We all remember the horrific destruction that took place in Haiti, how the world came together, the United Nations agencies. I think it was in March of 2010, there was a major donors conference to help develop funds to help the Haitians rebuild their society. Where are we today? How is that going on? What is the situation in Haiti? You, you make several trips down there. What is happening today? Well, as you know, Bill, Haiti, uh, after the earthquake, had to go to an election, despite all the problems, difficulties. And they were able to do it successfully. There were some issues, some problems, of course. But then um, elections took place. Uh, Michel Martelly, a uh, former uh, very popular singer, known as Sweet Mickey, was elected president. He was sworn in on uh, May 14th, and now he's been, uh, he has um, designated a prime minister, and we were waiting the prime minister's confirmation to parliament. And then, now, once all these mechanisms are in place, uh, the money that was pledged two years, a year ago at the UN during the don donors' pl uh, conference, ostensibly, would be dispersed and you will, you will begin to see uh, development. Hopefully uh, some rubble will movement massively and some uh, rebuilding going on for the next five or 10 years. Now it's been estimated, I've read articles and what have you, how the rubble, there's still quite a bit of rubble. And of course you, you have, it's a, it's a catch 22. You have to work, UN agencies like the UN Children's Fund and the World Food Program have to work to help the people who are alive stay alive and of course you just can't uh, throw up houses overnight but you also have to have rubble removal how has that played out have they been able to balance that that delicate balance of helping the people who are alive rebuild stay alive but also remove the rubble because you can't rebuild the city with 70 or 80 percent of it in rubble well i think now in, in the interim while international community was waiting for duly elected government uh, the focus has been to keeping people alive. There was a cholera epidemic in between all of these problems. Right. I mean, we, we, we forgot to mention that earlier. Mm -hmm. But there's been other issues, sort of like life urgency things that have to be taken care of. And, and those have been done quite well, I would say, successfully. I mean, there hasn't been, even the cholera epidemic uh, was quickly contained, and now I think it's, it's, it's well uh, uh, taken care of, although it's still in existence. But, the massive death that we expected at a, during a cholera epidemic didn't occur. But in terms of rubble removal, that's been really where the sticky wicket, where uh, it, it has been done from, from an individual basis. We have homeowners clearing their own rubble, school owners, old schools were destroyed, taking initiative, but the massive sort of well-coordinated effort that is needed hasn't been taking place. I think uh, that's the next phase of, of, of the development of, of post-earthquake Haiti. And of course, they had a session at the UN not too long ago. They brought some more countries back together to kind of refocus attention on Haiti and to help people realize that the Haitian disaster is still going on. It occurred on January 12, 2010, and that was the worst part probably, but still there's a lot of suffering, there's still a lot of people who are dispossessed and they need more assistance. Have they seen, have there it's been some lessons learned over the past year and a half or so as to what they might be able to do differently or to be more effective and to be more efficient? Well, I think the Haiti disaster presented a lot of challenges to everyone because this is a country that, whose infrastructure were challenged before the earthquake. And post-earthquake, it, it has been even worse, obviously. Uh, and in many ways, the, the response to Haiti has been a model for the international community how to respond, how to avert uh, more death in a, in a very difficult situation. Uh, what I think 
the lesson learned is how do you move forward? And I think uh, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, the primary concern was to have this government in place. Now that that's been done, it's how do you work with this government? Um, you know, Bill, we will be talking about Haiti for the next 10 years. I see the reconstruction lasting well beyond that. Uh, this is a country that it needs to be rebuilt completely from top to bottom. Uh, and, and we're going to need good governance. We're going to need an influx of uh, human capital in the country as well as financial capital because it's one thing to, to have the money, but you need competent people to manage this fund and, and ensure that uh, money is, is disbursed for the right project and not just going willy-nilly uh, here and there without any concerted, well-thought-out, well-coordinated plan. And so that's where we are right now, just making sure that you know the way things have been done in the past are not done the same way because evidently they were not very successful. Now, there had been some discussion about having satellite cities. Instead of having everybody in Port-au-Prince, and Port-au-Prince is right on a major fault line. They're, they may never have another earthquake for 100 or 200 years, but they may tomorrow. You never know. Uh, hopefully they won't, but have they talked about developing satellite cities, maybe have built smaller communities around Port-au-Prince and have people move there? I know a lot of people don't want to move out of Port-au-Prince, so you run into that challenge, but have, has there been any discussion of that? Well, since the early 1990s, decentralization has been a key uh, policy uh, for every president. Uh, the rub is, how do you uh, implement that? I think uh, right now this is a great moment for that where Port-au-Prince is, to build Port-au-Prince, you have to build out. And, and this is the, the, the sentiment of almost everyone in Haiti. They realize that Port-au-Prince is just teeming. This is a city built that was uh, uh, designed for half a million people. Now we're talking about 2.5 million people living in the metropolitan area. The sewer system, the electrical grid, j just about everything needs to be redesigned. And to do that, they have to, look towards the central plateau, the northern pl uh, plains in Haiti, the southern peninsula. Those are places where you could build sustainable cities, uh, well-designed uh, cities that, people will be, that will be attractive to people to move to. But Port-au-Prince definitely has to be rethought out because it just cannot hold the amount of people that the metropolitan area now holds. I remember when I was a child, um, Port-au-Prince was a really livable city, but now it's unlivable. You have traffic jam well into 9 o'clock uh, because, I mean, in certain neighborhoods. What has happened also is you have certain neighborhoods that have been destroyed, and so everybody have, has moved to one side of the city. So right there, it has so clogged that it's, 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 it's really miserable <laughs> the, the whole day. I mean, maybe Sunday morning when people are at a church or asleep, <laughs> that's the only time where you don't have... 9 a.m. Sunday morning, exactly. no traffic. <laughs> that's right. But that's the thing we have to remember, that there were tremendous problems prior to this earthquake. As you mentioned, Port-au-Prince was overpopulated as far as the services. And that's the health why services, you educational have services. such high death rate in Port-au-Prince. Exactly right. Plus the building code, too. It was never very high, not only in, Port in Haiti, but in many countries countries around the world. Many of them are right on the ring of fire, the earthquake lines and what have you. And so I'm assuming now the building codes are going to be tighter when they come back and they actually start building. They'll uh, tighten them up or make them more strict. Is that correct? Well, Bill, again, as a lot of things with Haiti, the codes are there. It's the enforcement that's the problem. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and okay. and the, the, yeah. if you go to the archives, you'll be really uh, impressed by the codes, the rule of law. Everything is there. The question is enforcing what's in existence. Codes in Haiti, and they, the, the experts have known about the, the, the fault line, and so they are codes. They're not enforced, and that's the challenge for the new government to ensure that, and to have penalties once these laws are broken. And, and, the, and how do you change that culture? It's a challenge for everyone. Now, it's a little early, I guess, for Michel Martelly, the new president of Haiti, but has he indicated what he would like to do? Has he laid out? I'm sure he had a 
platform on which he ran to be elected, or he, you know, he wouldn't say, just elect me and I'll go forth and do good in the future, <laughs> but what, what were some of the ideas that he threw out, or what would he like to do or like to implement to maybe help the re rebuilding, reconstruction go quicker, to help people get their lives back together? Well, you know, I haven't been a big fan of, of Martelli for several reasons, but I must give him credit on this end. He has realized that the future of Haiti rests with education, as any other society. And what he has done so far, which is very impressive, he has instituted two taxes, one on foreign calls coming into Haiti from overseas. The other one is a tax on money transfers that is a, to the tune of a couple billion dollars that comes into Haiti. And that tax is for uh, elementary education, free elementary education for everyone in Haiti. And I think that's a good and smart long-term plan. And this is what he has done that has been impressed to me. He spoke about that and he is carrying it out. And I think Haiti lacks you know, the, the, the brand power that I, that I mentioned because this is a country for the last 50 years, Bill, that has uh, undergone a tremendous brand drain. More Haitian doctors in New York and Miami and Montreal and the Dominican Republic than in Haiti itself. And so we certainly need to create an environment where everyone has access to at least an elementary education, and then we take it from there. So I, I credit him for this initiative, and, and, and so far it seems that he's carrying it out, and that's a good thing. And there are, the, the money for the reconstruction of Haiti is there. It's a question of management, but I think you have to look at beyond the reconstruction of Haiti, the future of Haiti, and I think he is taking that on, and I think that's really smart. And of course, with any leader, any president, any chancellor, whatever, the key is to have good people around you, people who know what they're doing, people who are honest, people who are effective, and they can get the job done because one person cannot do it all. It's absolutely impossible, as we are all aware. We should have mentioned probably at the beginning, Haiti is on the island of Hispaniola, which is, it shares with the, its neighbor, the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic, I think, is about 25,000 square miles, something like that, with 9 million people. Haiti is what, about a third of the size of the DR? With about the same it, population. The same population of 9 million, which is, and it's a hilly, mountainous rocky. country, rocky. And you alluded to that, and that is a real challenge, just in itself to, as we talk about rebuilding cities, you mentioned look to the north, look to the south and the plateaus, and that is a challenge to do that because you, you just can't build a city on the side of a mountain. <laughs> it's not going to work. So it, it is a very, very strong challenge to, to the Haitian government and to the Haitian people. Well, yeah, it is, and, but I think um, it can be done. Uh, there are existing cities that could be uh, enlarged just uh, reconceptualize to accommodate the population. Because as it is right now, the mountainous part are inhabitable. I mean, they are impassable. Although you have some people living up in these mountains area, but it is so remote that it would take you uh, almost half a day to go 20 kilometers or so. Uh, once you're at the foot of the mountain, dangerous. You have to, in many ways, you have to hike it uh, by, on foot and, and, and so, those are areas that we're not even discussing because not, to me they're unlivable. Uh, and so the, the, the experts, the city planners, there, there's enough to work there if, they, if, they, if the will and the commitment is there. That's very, very important. The countries of the world really rallied, I think, a large number of the countries, the United Nations agencies, many of them which were operating in Haiti, already, in fact, were there during the earthquake and lost several hundred members of their teams, especially the peacekeepers that were down there trying to help stabilize and promote peace and stability. There was a civilian head and, yeah, right. and a military head, both of them, at one moment, it was paralyzed, you know, without your leadership, especially with the military, how do you function? And for a couple of days, uh, the military component just was really frozen. No, it certainly was, and that, that's certainly one of the problems. I remember, too, though, that there were countries that did things individually. I was in the Dominican Republic not too long ago and read an article in one of the newspapers about the Dominican Republic was going to start a university in Haiti, and you were talking about education and how important that is. And, of course, many other countries, I would imagine, are doing one-on-one -on -one assistance, bilateral assistance, to help Haitians. Well, you have Venezuela. Hugo Chavez has been a big supporter of Haiti. He has donated millions for roads. I mean, uh, one of the knock on Martelli's predecessor was his lack of media savviness, his lack of communicating some of the things that 
he had accomplished. Uh, if you go to the northern part of Haiti, the roads are absolutely beautiful. Uh, they're there. Uh, a lot of that was even before the earthquake uh, from, with money from Venezuelan government. And, and, and so there are a lot of uh, help that Haiti has received from uh, countries, single countries. But I think one of the places that the Haitian government, the, the, the prior gov administration dropped the ball is uh, there were a lot of pledges from nations. But they, there needed to be some follow-up done, and which was not done. And I'm hoping that the current administration can do that. He is obviously an entertainer. He was one of the greatest entertainers in Haitian history. He understands marketing and PR. And so I, I hope that he can do the follow-up that's necessary to ensure that a lot of the, these monies that were pledged are actually given to Haiti. Uh, these are countries, for the most part, democracies, where it's the legislators who actually uh, 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 votes the money into the budget so the president or the prime minister cannot just write a blank check. And so there's some lobbying that has to be done at, the, at this level. And so the Haitian government now should understand that and make that a priority. And you're talking about his ability to interact with the media and, and do PR and that type of thing, which is extremely important, extremely important to get the message out. It ties into that whole CNN moment, the CNN effect that we hear about. You're in the media and you know, well, you knew what it was like when the, after the earthquake had struck. CNN went in, all the major media outlets went into Port-au-Prince. They camped out, they focused on the problem, they did human interest stories. They were very effective in getting the word out for about a month <laughs> and then after that the, the CNN oil moment happened something that's else happened, right and, and then, then they then kind then. of drifted away and and a lot of people think that Haiti's been rebuilt and that certainly is not <laughs> the case but how can you keep the spotlight on Haiti what can be done to help get that message out uh, through outlets such as South South News through the Haitian Times through other organs like that how can you get the word to people to let them know that the rebuilding is taking place, it's moving slowly at times, but we still have to keep, the, keep our eye on it and keep the spotlight on it. Well, obviously, Bill, you mentioned CNN moment. The keyword is a moment. I mean, it cannot last. I mean, in our business, you know, you move on to other things. There are other important things. It, and, and as important as Haiti is to me uh, per personally, as a journalist, I know that, you know, my colleagues, uh, cannot focus on it as much as I do because I am the publisher and the editor of the Haitian Times. That's what I do. What I, what I like to do, what I do f personally is I, I keep the story alive and occasionally I pitch ideas to my colleagues in the uh, general media uh, realm and good stories uh, are picked up and are published. I know that uh, Anderson Cooper, uh, the CNN anchor, is personally committed to, to Haiti's story. He is really done a tremendous job keeping it alive, if you will, and, and, and whenever there's a moment uh, where it, it's, it, it warrants taking a look at it, and, and CNN has done that. And the other, I know MSNBC, I am a contributor to their uh, website, thegrio.com, and so we've kept that story alive as much as you can. But we have to be realistic that, you know, it just cannot, that moment has an end, and, 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 and you just can return to it and bites over the years just keep people updating uh, with what's happening during the elections during the present there was a moment where it, <coughs> Haiti was back in the me, uh, media and so we're just trying to keep that going as much as we can right and of course there's tremendous competition for that time on CNN or whatever it might be and they, there are many articles vying for it. Maybe they could do a few uh, personal comment, a few fewer articles on the tabloid stuff, <laughs> and talk more about the subject yeah, and stuff. I really don't but care. We're, we're just about out of time, Gary. Before we do run out of time, you mentioned to me earlier that you're setting up a center for diaspora journalism. What is diaspora journalism? And briefly, how can we learn more about it? Well, it's a center at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, the City University of City New York. Of, yes, City okay. University of CUNY. New York. CUNY. And uh, essentially, we've had a mandate from the Ford Foundation to come up with you know, a center that would address issues facing what we used to call the ethnic press in, this, in the city, in New York City. And to me, that press has evolved from a ethnic to a diaspora in the sense that the news from the homeland is as important to people living here as sort of like the local city council news. And so with the internet, there's a opportunities and challenges. So now we're gonna look at ways to sustain these, for the most part, mom and pop operations 
because they are playing a very important role in the media ecosystem in New York City and in, in, in the area. And so we are tasked to come up with a center that would be a repository of information for that media sector at CUNY. Now, are you focusing primarily on Caribbean countries, mm -hmm. Latin American, all around the all Middle around East, the, Asian, Pakistan, everyone, India, everybody. just whatever exists, we, we will be here to, to, to train, uh, sustain. Well, Gary Pierre Pierre, you're doing some very interesting things, and I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. A pleasure. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on South South News. <laughs>